Hi, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, is that on? Okay. Um, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to the second evening of lectures by winners of the Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers. We also have a sort of second opening again, so after the lecture, please join us um, in the gallery and in the hallway for a drink and to meet the architects. Once again, we'd like to thank longtime program sponsors and altogether total architecture enthusiasts, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, and corporate supporter Tischler and Son um, for making this program possible. Thanks also to the Architectural League's Next Generation Fund, which is an alumni fund of the League's both past Emerging Voices and Architectural League prize winners. They're sort of paying it forward to a new generation of architects and designers. The League would also like to thank Caterina Toscano and Roberto Campos of the Mexican Cultural Authority, who, working with the airline Interjet, provided valuable travel support for the partners of Lanza. We're incredibly grateful to the entire staff of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at Parsons School of Design at the New School for once again hosting the exhibit and lecture series and for the installation guidance provided by their stellar gallery team. Thanks also to the dean and staff of the School of Constructed Environments for sharing their new space for our storage needs. And on the league side, I would like to once again thank Matt Ragazzo. This is Matt's last program. He's heading off to graduate school to be an architect um, at the end of the summer, and um, who creatively and patiently managed this year's program, and league program staff, Katarina Flaxman, who's taking over the helm, uh, that program associate, Lindsay Murrow, Akiba Blander, and Gilbert Santana for their help with the installation and the upcoming digital content that we'll be producing from some of the other related interviews and things we're doing with this program. This program is um, shaped each year by the League Prize Committee, which is a very small group of recent winners. We select a new group of three people annually, and they're the ones who come up with the theme that you see and the statement describing the theme. They also select their fellow jurors. Um, this year, they were Selby Olaven, Guy Nordensen, Mark Robbins, and Shohei Shigematsu. The committee was Aaron Bessler, Aaron Forrest, and Sungu Yang, who's going to introduce tonight's lecture. So thank you for joining us. Good evening. Uh, my pronunciation at night getting worse, so sorry about that in advance. So welcome to the Architecture League Prize 2017, I second. My name is Song Yang, one of the committees this year. Uh, as you know, this year's theme is support, and I would like to start this introduction with several questions relevant to that theme. A few examples of, th of those questions are, what does support stand for? How is support situated? What are the politics of support? What support your work? What does your work support? Are there certain conditions of support? What is the situation which has least support? How is an architecture with precarious support look like? Which part of your design is defined against support? Is there a design without any support? How do you manage the relationship between the thing being supported the nature of the support. If, if support is caught up in the idea of change or compromise, is it always in the form of positive reinforcement? What props up architecture today? Uh, you will be able to find answers through these three I am about, about to introduce. We are very excited to have them here tonight to further share their great insight to this year theme support. So, uh, today's first answer is by Jonathan Liu and Nicole McIntosh of Architecture Office. Uh, Jonathan Liu and Nicole McIntosh founded Architecture Office in Syracuse. Uh, their work support architecture's unique capacity to not be static and singular, but to simultaneously engage and refresh the real-time value of the things around it. Uh, Jonathan Liu studies a mark at University of California and BR at Syracuse University. He is assistant professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture. He is one of four founding organizers for On the Road, a platform for changing uh, architecture experimentation outside of the museum and institution. Uh, Nico McIntosh uh, studied at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, where she also taught alongside Mark Angeli. After living in desert while being a teaching fellow at Taliesin School of Architecture, she was a lecturer at University of Arizona. She is currently uh, assistant professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture. 
architecture. Please welcome Jonathan and Nico. Uh, thank you. We're really honored um, to be here tonight among such talented young designers and are very thankful to the uh, jurors for receiving this prize. Um, also, we would like to thank um, Anne and Matt um, for helping us and their team for helping us um, with the coordination of the event and exhibition. Uh, we had a really fantastic time here. And also we would like to thank uh, our Dean Michael Speaks and our colleagues in, at Syracuse University who um, supported the development of our work. And lastly, of course, friends and family who are here tonight. Yeah. So um, we wanted to start off with, with our um, support slide um, from our portfolio. And uh, we wrote this one thinking about the prompt for this year's um, Young Architects Award. Um, we could not help but to think about the images around us and how we gather, deploy, and actualize it to support our work. The title of our proposal, There There, draws on the support of a pervasive uh, image culture to construct new designs that question the signification of a thing in relation to its intent. Images are a fund fundamental element in today's world and through image saturation, we now question the single legible vocabulary of a thing. With this in mind, we consider the term there to be a singular place or position, and the there there draws on the accumulation of multiple places or positions. Um, here are images from our archive of projects that are currently in, in the office. Um, through literal representation and reconfigurations, our work aims to actualize images that both distinguish and deny form, um, material, surface, and structure of readily available things from its assumed disciplinary and cultural associations. To destabilize the experience of images and things by displacing or interrupting their uh, familiarity, be it context, materiality, or other characteristics. The images influence both the means and ends of our work, supporting the uh, project's conception and also finding their appearance as part of the outcome. Throughout the presentation, we would like to talk a little bit more about uh, some of these images that made it, made it into our work. Just to give a quick example, um, this is an image collection of a, of a project uh, we did in 2015. Um, it highlights the transference of an image across mediums. Um, in this case, the reconfiguration of uh, the iconic blue and white colors uh, that are found in uh, Portuguese azulejos throughout uh, uh, many cities and, and uh, buildings in Portugal. Um, but more recently, they have transferred from tile to knitwear to advertisement to the 2013 Jean-Paul Gaultier line on the bottom right. Um, and our proposal on the right-hand side, a new temporary storefront wallpaper for a small shoe retailer uh, in Abrantes, Portugal. The wallpaper design averages a local azulejos colors into five DNA color blocks. Um, it was installed for the 2015 180 Creative Camp Festival. Um, and to build on this, uh, today we'll talk uh, about four projects. Each one looks at different aspects of transference and the there there. The first project we would like to talk about is a research project that we're currently compiling uh, for an upcoming exhibition. The, projects, uh, the project looks at the tension between codes and cultural themes in American towns as a transportation and translation of cultural associations. We'd like to thank our two uh, assistants, Hanika Fundersen and Jose Gobas, for the help with this project. Strewn across the American landscapes, are suburbs, neighborhoods, and enclaves that exude qualities and characteristics that follow Euro European cultural themes. With names such as Frankenmuth, Linzburg, or New Glarus, we located 14 towns that visually convinced their visitors to be, to be not here, but there. Jean Baudrillard would argue they do not lay claim to being extraordinary. They are simply extraordinary due to their indulgence towards their own banality. Here at another dare, nostalgia for a place has taken over, creating a bizarre type of cultural preservation. It is an entertaining form of image and cultural identity. 
For example, um, at a gift shop in Solvang, a Danish town in California, you can buy postcards with images taken in Denmark. Narrating back to popular European destinations through imagery, it is uncertain if one is there there. Highly curated through popular imported historic form, they resemble what we all know as being German, Swiss, Dutch, <coughs> Czech, or Swedish. These tourist towns are the evidence for the influence of media as built manifestations. Here, a collection of typical alpine, uh, alpine windows by photographer Andre Vincent Gonzalez in relation to Vail, Colorado, that was built after Swiss alpine towns. They show that in the present period of time, there is a desire to create an identity through the images of cultures in relation to history. Similar to Wes Anderson movies, where construct, constructed analogies of historic uh, historically signifying architecture, reinforce the narrative in the scenery, deploying architectural details that evoke certain associations and feelings for a place and its culture, and at the same time create a new but very familiar identity. They are the post-production of the theme park, a new tourist destination, their design driven by consumption. As once Walt Disney for Disney's showcase imagined, Shop, they are shopping areas where stores and whole streets recreate the character and adventure of places around the world. For some people, there might be a popular weekend getaway. For others, they are simply an image of home. We are particularly fascinated by New Glorious Wisconsin, America's little Switzerland. Founded, in settlers in 19, founded by settlers in 1945, it evolved from an agricultural town to a tourist town with Swiss characteristics. It's not quite here or there, but it's between the Swiss and the American landscape. One is neither here nor there, more so at another there. Here uh, in New Glorious, you'll find a selection of historic types that collide with local construction techniques. In this town, characteristics of built form and material are shifted, and tectonic values are lost in translation. Once the Beckers found them in Ger Germany, you find new types of the Regal Bau here in New Glorious, Wisconsin. To control and regulate the urban setting, the building uh, department's design review committee consoled Swiss design examples illustrated in eight different books that were published over 40 years ago. Like the two shown on the left, the books show images of an architecture that has long passed in its country of origin. Here, the there tries to capture the there back in another time. And although long gone there, it seems preserved here at the other there in Wisconsin's Little Switzerland. Additionally, the town currently flourishes under Article 2, titled Swiss Architectural Theme in the Building Codes. It is divided into s typical Swiss architectural elements that support the nostalgic image of the physical built Switzerland, um, which may result, as you can see here, um, with uh, the bal a Swiss balcony overlaid on top of a typical American housing development. Are we there there? Although the imagery seems to be persistent, there are also desired things found in everyday American life uh, that make their appearance on these elevations, um, such as the American flag, the air conditioning unit, or the steakhouse sign. Here is an example, uh, the corner of a themed Main Street facade, Sportsman's Bar and Grill. They are surreal and at the same time, very real. These elements cause different associations to collide with one another. At the corner of the Hitch and Hyde building, shown here, um, you see a shingle-clad party wall that meets the Falkwerk facade. And currently, um, as we mentioned, we're compiling an exhibition. Uh, and at our architecture office, we're collecting a series of these facade drawings and uh, building these corner models that are characterized as Swiss, pointing to codes as part of a continuous Swiss, Swiss condition and tradition with an American flair. In the next two projects, um, the Dare Dare reconfigures imagery of a setting to produce an ensemble with, it, with its an existing environment, sometimes emulating it and at the same time mixing it with other alien qualities to construct a particular identity. House in House is a house that references multiple things in its surrounding environment. It's situated about an hour south of Seattle in a forest along a lake. 
On the side is an existing cedar log kit cabin built in the 1950s. Although the cabin is not historically preserved, uh, we believe that it has a certain cultural value to the Pacific Northwest. The look, material, structure seems to belong here. We, ha we had hopes of integrating the existing cabin into our design, but there is not a permanent foundation and the structure was not really, is not really in good condition. Like the existing cabin, we built a new internal cabin with mi minimal infrastructure and facilities one needs for living, such as a bathroom, kitchen, storage, and bedroom. It has the same pro footprint as the existing cabin and is surrounded by an open floor plan that became a generous living and dining area. It is a house in a house. The inner house looks like a sculpture and functions as a house. Uh, it is made out of thick concrete and with a permanent footprint. It's meant to be there and contains all of the necessities for a modest living. Um, it is also an homage to the existing cabin that we removed. The outer house looks like a house and acts only as an enclosure. Inspired by the American track home, such as the ones photographed by Dan Graham, it is made out of a typical wood frame construction with the crawl space below. The outer house shelters the inner house, producing two levels of permanence, the concrete inner core and the shingle clad exterior. Um, specific, specific to the site was not only the existing cabins and surrounding homes, but also the trees and color vari variations of the forest. We are projecting low fidelity photographs of nature painted onto the hardy shingle uh, exterior to create a relationship with the existing environment. To make the house part of the setting, we produced an ensemble by overlaying the images of its environment with the house. Not to form a stylistic unity, but more so a hybrid of mul multiple parts. Linking the pixel of the images with typical shingles found in the area. From a, from a broader point of view, the ensemble of elements construct unexpected details that create an additional alienation from the expected image. For example, by integrating the gutter into the form of the house, it allows us to reduce um, the distinction between the roof and wall into one singular shape producing an unexpected or odd-looking detail that is an additional estrangement of the, of the um, typical track home. The second project we'd like to show is one that's still under development um, at our architecture office. Um, this past spring, we were uh, approached to develop a small cabin um, in eastern Washington amongst a sage field uh, in Kittitas County. While driving through the area, uh, we were inspired by the barns found throughout the countryside and the indifferent but direct relationship between the internal truss and exterior cladding systems that comprise these structures. Um, in particular, uh, the, the truss was of interest to us and um, we started to think about the kind of value of the truss itself that relies on optimal web span and beam connection versus the, the kind of analogous and charming appearance that we're most interested in. Um, in particular, the, the analogous image produces variations um, on the system, material, and form of these trust structures. And in the project, we are interested in finding opportunities where the webbing meets the vertical structure to be able to create different sectional qualities within a one-story building. This allows for different spatial configurations through the repetition of self-similar elements within the framework. By altering the core, ge the core geometry at the base of the truss, we're able to create three different living zones um, within the house. From left to right is an entry porch, uh, a middle core with a storage unit above, and on the very right-hand side is a um, living and dining area that is housed under a pitched roof. Um, our goal was not to compose the trusses within the building, but more so to set up an outline uh, for the trusses to repeat themselves within. For example, the C spacing defines the kitchen appliances, the B spacing is a standard spacing, and the C spacing connects the width of the entrance corridor to shape the window and extends to the view beyond. 
to keep the interior square footage under the required 800 square feet, we subtract it from the mass through porches that are integrated into the framework. The exterior porches are a continuation of interior rooms extending views out into the sage field. The trusses are enclosed by a board and batten system that obscure the interior framework. The boards are on horizontal stripes set at intervals of six, nine, and 12 inches wide. At the porches, we're simply removing the boards to create a, a semi-enclosed patio. To distinguish between the sub subtle de depth of the board and batten, we're projecting purplish colors sourced from the existing sage field onto customized aluminum battens, dissolving the colors as it moves towards the sky, sky by using the thin vertical strips to mimic the sage growing around it. So the next project that we'd like to show is um, one that, that we did uh, two years ago, but continues to live on. Um, it's called Big Will and Friends, and it's a traveling installation and stage for performance. Um, the project is uh, something that builds on some of our research that was done uh, on wallpaper and as a consumer product that confuses the distinction between two-dimensional illusions with physical depth. Um, and um, we'd also like to thank um, two sets of people, Stephen Zyma, uh, who was a collaborator uh, when we first showed the piece. He displayed a series of collages uh, on the walls of the installation. Uh, we won't talk too much about the collages, um, but we'd like to thank him nonetheless. Um, and as well as our two design assistants, uh, Nicholas Carmona and Gabriel Boyajian, uh, who helped us with the construction and design of the project. Um, we'd like to first start with um, a little, little bit about Clement Greenberg, um, a Syracuse alumni. Um, he argued for the distinction between architectural and pictorial limits to construct the bias that the discipline of painting distinguish it se distinguishes itself from the physical walls that support it. But to paraphrase from his own terminology on wallpaper, it is a kind of picture that without actually becoming identified with the wall would spread all over it. In writing this, we believe he is unknowingly forecasting that the spread of wallpaper blurs the distinction between the purely pictorial and the wall as an architectural substrate, pushing on the limits of two disciplines by connecting shape as concurrently a fundamental property of objects in space and a medium for image. With that being said, um, we Love that Cecil Beaton uh, photographs uh, and photographed Jackson Pollock's autumn rhythm as a wallpaper-like backdrop for his <coughs> new soft look uh, Vogue fashion shoot um, that you see here. Um, our wallpaper project, Big Will, is an installation that appropriates Morrison Company's thistle wallpaper designed by John Henry Dearly, and it, pl it applies it all over a house-like figure. Big Will is a one-to-one -one scale, rep one -one scale representation, a kind of literal drawing uh, applied to articulate a material surface. It collapses the depth of the wall with the illusions of an image to merge the point where material meets representation. In thinking about the drawing as an articulated surface, we started the project by creating a series of drawings that collapse the planar walls of the figure into a singular uh, picture plane. Here's another drawing. Um, the drawings dissolve the physical depth of the planes to construct a visual play between the legibility and, uh, of the fissile pa pattern and, and an overwhelming effect. To conceal the physical structure within its visual context, the project is constructed from a framework work of white PVC pipes and 3D printed joints with painted scrim stretched across the frame. Both the visual and physical support are based on a two-foot spacing that melts the structure with the imagery. The visual overlap um, of the surfaces produces a confusing appearance that at times appears as a flat painting, and at times a three-dimensional environment, and at times a house-like figure. Um, over the past year, Big Will has traveled and met many, many, many new friends. Um, eliminating the boundary between the artwork and its viewer while perceptually extending or flattening the visual space of the installation. Um, the video that we're watching uh, was done in collaboration with choreographer Stephanie White 
and videographer Adam Greenberg. Um, it is a temporary happening that alters the perceptions of the piece. While watching the video, one thing to look for is the uh, material properties of the scrim that allow for a range of visual effects. Um, where depending on the lighting location and the time of day, sometimes you perceive the material and sometimes you perceive the image. As you know, the project's been traveling for a little bit. Um, we've shown it in Syracuse, New York, and Eindhoven, Netherlands. Um, and we hope to keep collaborating with the performers uh, as we continue to travel in the Big Whip. We'd like to conclude by talking a little bit about the installation you've designed uh, for the exhibition next door. Um, the title Viewfinders is named after the part of the camera that frames a view of a subject. In the installation, we have an interest in expanding the, the visitor's field of vision to reveal part of our archive. This includes a selection of photographs, screenshots, and movie clips. Um, we invite you to scroll through the selected images, each one shifting the fields of view to collapse other dares with the here. Each viewfinder is built as a combine of things that takes in, on a new identity. A sound-packed traveling tripod, molding plastic downspout fittings, matte black paint, gaffer tape, and costume connections. Um, the project was photographed by Thomas Kim and built with the help of John Bryant of Haywood Fabrication and uh, Syracuse University. So uh, as the last slide and, and statement we'd like to make is um, our work aims to actualize images that both distinguish and deny form, material, and surface, uh, as well as structure of readily available things from its assumed disciplinary and cultural associations. Um, supporting architecture's unique capacity to not be static and singular, but to simultaneously engage and refresh the things around it. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Nico, thank you. Uh, so second answer is by Isabel Abascal and Alessandro Arienzo of Lanza Atelier. 
Uh, Isabella and Al Alessandro founded Lanza Atelier in 2015 in Mexico City. Their work has been about how unwell succeeded space support daily life, how an architecture support different situations, and how public structures support tolerance and coexistence. Uh, Lanza's recent projects include Casa El in Valle in the Bravo, Mexico, editorial MP office in Mexico City, and public toilets and kiosk for seven kilometer bike path in Ecatepec, Mexico. Isabel Martinez Abasca graduated from Universidad Politécnica de Madrid and studied at Technische uh, Universität in Berlin and at the Fastu Shilpa Foundation in Ahmed Ahmedabad, India. Uh, she has been teaching at Escola da Cidade in Sao Paulo. She also has been ex executive director of the Liga space for architecture platform in Mexico City, dedicated to the exhibition, dissemination, and discussion of Latin American architecture. Alessandro Arienzo graduated with honors from the Universidad American, uh, Ibero Americana. He produced exhibition basic structures in Galleria Breve in Almeida Central, and he is currently recipient of, recipient of Fonca Young Creators Grant Program this year. Please welcome Isabella and Alessandro. Thank you so. Good evening, hi everybody, and thanks for being here. A very special thanks to Caterina Roberto and the Mexican Cultural Institute of New York, and of course to Juan Rieselbach Madragazzo, the Architectural League of New York, and its wonderful team who have been so supportive during the past few days. We would also like to give a special thanks to our wonderful team, Alejandro Marquez, Jessica Hernandez, Lili Carr, and Isabel Palacios, whose every day reward us with the most incredible attitude towards our work. And last but not least, to Pablo Iriarte, it's around him. Without him, uh, our installation for the League show would not have been possible. Gracias también a nuestras familias y amigos que siempre nos han apoyado incondicionalmente. Meeting the other winners of this edition of a prize which was established in 1981, before we were even born, has been a fascinating and fun experience. So thanks to our colleagues and to everybody who has made this happen. As the only team coming from outside the United States, based in Mexico, we are here proudly trying to show that ways of thinking, ways of doing, and visions on how architecture can contribute to the world are not and cannot be limited to any physical boundaries and that the values that we share are universal. So what supports architecture? We can easily name several people, things, and situations that have indeed encouraged our practice. Lanza, which is now two and a half years old. But in the light of this competition theme, the opposition question also rose before us. What does architecture support? And therefore, as architects, what is our commitment to the world? Architecture is, as we all know, a, a long-term career. Most at least for singers reach the peak of their performances in their early 20s. And at that age, an architect is, with good luck, finishing he or her university degree. Regardless, and as her ad admired Brazilian masters, Oscar Niemeyer or Paulo Mendes da Rocha, have demonstrated and keep demonstrating an architect can produce great work after turning 80. So there is no need to worry. We became architects less than 10 years ago. This means we will be working for another 50 or who knows, 60 years. Then, what does a prize for young architects mean? We assume that we are not receiving an award for what we have done, but also what we could do or are going to do. How could this be possible if those things are not yet there? But well, we have to come realize that every project we design, every project we build, relates somehow to other ones we have done before. So somehow, by understanding the driving forces that structure our work, one can sneak a peek into the future of Lanza. Thus, we will try to present today not just isolated projects, but also the connections in between them. The first project we want to talk about is one of the smallest we have done so far, the League Prize Exhibition Installation, which we decided to build as we wanted to involve the one-to-one -one scale of architecture in this exhibition. 
As things camouflage themselves in nature with their own context, we intended to blend in with our surroundings at the Aronson Gallery. The installation intends to question the boundary between architecture and the exhibition of architecture. The piece is in itself an architectural element that takes advantage of one of the corners of the Aronson Gallery. We wanted to invite the public to visit five of our built projects in their, origin in their original orientation. The curve-shaped wall responds to them in their actual positions. An example for us are Islamic mosques that are always oriented towards Mecca, no, ma no matter the street alignment nor the adjacent building. This concept produces a second curved wall that initially appears to be part of the building, but at, at a second glance reveals it as something foreign. Upon approaching it, the visitor will notice a number of peepholes. Visitors can look through these to discover five dioramas that present five projects by Lanza. In this way, a device that allows the public to enter into other worlds is itself supported by a work of architecture. Later, we discovered and were enthralled by the Kaiser Sensorama, one of the first experiments with virtual reality. So now we are going to pick a th uh, through each of these peepholes and see what's inside. Zooming into the first of these five projects, that also was our first project, we moved to the outskirts of Mexico City. The so-called poorest area on the east of the city, the only one that Pope Francisco insisted on visiting during his trip to Mexico last year. In Ecatepec, this marginal neighborhood with high crime rates rates a new bicycle track seven kilometers long, serves as a linear park that connects in with Nezahualcoyotl. The bike lane takes advantage of the remaining space between the superficial metro lane and the wide road called Avenida Central. When commissioned to design washrooms and shade for the bicycle track, we saw an opportunity to achieve low-cost common spaces in an area that needed quality public infrastructure. To this end, we propose three washroom models and 13 pairs of kiosks with the aim of creating a democratic urban fabric. As the climb model dissolves the rigid duality in between inside and outside, we wanted to blur the boundaries between <coughs> private and public space and propose situations in which you enter an outside space or where you go out to find yourself in a semi-interior space. The washroom pavilions function as permeable elements with a microclimate favored by the growth of plants acting as small oases for the whole district, which tends to be arid due to the severe deforestation of the area. We also tackle the project as an educational tool to help foster the coexistence of genders in a very segregated area. Thus, men and women share the common spaces of kiosks and washrooms in an atmosphere of tolerance. Within the overall slab of each group of washrooms, there are four double modules deployed in a cross pattern. Each of these modules is an open space with a glass dome set into the roof so that when you enter them, you're going outside. Three other openings, like small courtyards, are located over the plant beds that traverse the roof slab in the direction of the sun. There is no clear distinction between being inside and outside. The kiosks are distributed intermittently along the bicycle track. Its walls also form a cross with benches and tables that are embedded in the block walls, using the gaps left by the formwork. On each kiosk, there is a central patio traversed by a large palm tree, making a direct reference to one of Jean-Jacques Lecoeur kiosk drawings. The landscaping project incorporated 100 new trees. Vines cover the fence that divide <coughs> the avenue and the bicycle track, creating a, great, a green division between the traffic and the cyclists, joggers and pedestrians. Palm trees are generally located within the kiosk in the small central courtyard and jacaranda trees are planted in more organic arrangement within the base. Bamboo was used only in washrooms models to create a visual division between male and female toilets. Shared wash basins are located in the central space favoring the respectful coexisting of all users. In both typologies, we aim to explore the gradations between interior and exterior and the ability of an extremely simple initial program to embrace the wealth and unpredictability of uses. This project was completed more than two years ago. Spontaneous interventions such as graffiti on the walls tells us that this architecture already belongs to the city and, this, it's, and its citizens. Second project through the wall is a device to support a series of exhibitions that have been and are going to take place at Humex Museum in Mexico City. 
this beautiful building by David Chipperfield. The project entitled Passersby and curated by Jose Esparza and Rodrigo Ortiz Monasterio is a series of microbiographical shows that highlight the passage through Mexico of foreigners that have influenced the national's artistic speech development. <coughs> because of the need to deal not with a single show, but with a cycle of shows, and now knowing much about the future ones, we needed to propose a device that could be highly flexible through time. Referencing the concept of a series of characters, this exhibition device consists of a mo modulated folding screen made of wood and brass. Each module unfolds a different display. The nine different typologies are structured in between them using unions that generate a great number of combinations. Tables, stands, shelves, windows, and brass bars characterize the panels that support the, document, the documentary materials exhibited in each one of Pasajero's shows. The first exhibition of the Passes By series gives a brief look into the legacy of the renowned theater director, Jerzy Grotowski, and his mysterious visits to Mexico. We therefore want to create a dramatic atmosphere that could evoke scenography and the uncanny. The secret behind the support of this biombo are the brass joints. We designed a simple system that holds the panels together just by adding a ring that falls, so to say, into the L-shaped arms. The ring allows us to connect two, three, or even four folding panels together. Each panel folds itself so the storage don't take too much space from the cellar. The second edition of the Passersby series focuses on the American writer and architecture critic Ster McCoy and on the country that she saw during her travels through Mexico in the 1950s. The show investigates this flow of references and ideas between Mexico and California, international style and popular styles, Luis Barragan and Rudolf Schindler, Clara Porcet and Richard Neutra through archival material. This exhibition also presents the work of contemporary artists who question Mexico's modernist language during that period and who simultaneously reflect the invisible flow of ideas between artists and the context where they develop. For this, for this edition, we propose a space lit by natural light filtered by curtains that referred California's 50s architecture and that incorporated plans referring to McCoy stays in Cuernavaca. Four new folding screens were developed inspired by McCoy's personality, and the nine existing ones were used again under a new light. The third project is located west from Mexico City in a small lake town called Valle de Bravo. We are talking about abstract connection tonight, but the establishment of physical connections is very present in our work. The House L project arises from the need to create a new connection for the rooms of an existing house. As this beautiful artwork by Felix Gonzalez Torres, the encounter of two things can be very poetic. To date, rooms were accessed through other rooms, and for this reason, the owners did not feel comfortable inviting friends because they could not offer them privacy. When the client bought the adjacent piece of land, the bordering wall became a leftover facade. With that purpose, the client wanted to build a hallway to organize a new individual entrances to the other rooms. The initial project also included a new independent two-story volume which functioned as an independent apartment with a living room, bedroom, bathroom, and kitchen. We propose solving both requirements with a single line, a group connection the old house and the new volume forming a new circulation, a route that is compressed and opens up as visitors traverse it. The intersection of this line with the existing house favor a side access to the house and therefore some internal changes in the layout, with the main bedroom and bathroom being completely reformulated. Traditional local materials were used, employed in a contemporary manner. This new space introduced, on the one hand, a new vanishing point and a new logic of flaws in the old house. On the other hand, walking across this space is an experience in itself primarily because the light that enters through the domes that enhance the texture of the, brick, of the brick. This suggests a moment to contemplate the exterior, the garden from a semi-interior space that be because it is on a slope gradually opens up to the outside in a different way. Thus we created a second facade for the house that detaches from the original one with the memory of the first curve drawn, allowing many things to happen in between them.
The next project has to do with the complexity of dealing with a lot of information, images, materials, data, which is a crucial issue in our times. This project is regarding its area of 2,000 square meters, the, the biggest one that Lanza has done until now. It is inside the Mexican National Palace, the seat of the Federal Executive Power of Mexico, located to the east of the Zócalo. It is built on an area of 40,000 square meters and its world heritage since 1987. Its construction began in 1522, a second private residence of Hernán Cortés, on top of a part of the Palace of Moctezuma. The architectural proposal for this exhibition, Art for the Nation, curated by James Olds, consisted of an infrastructure that organizes an exhibition about an extremely heterogeneous collection, the treasury collection. It is a result of the payment in kind program by which artists living in Mexico can pay their taxes by donating works of art. This collection, which is 40 years old, features artworks from masters like Diego Rivera or Matias Geritz and also contemporary artists like Francis Alice or Thomas Glassford. We wanted to work with this vast group of works in a modular and rational way that referred to the concept of archive and offer an image of lightness and fluidity. All the graphic works are hung from suspended panels that seem to float in space. These panels function as planes of color that relate to each other through cross views. Among the panels, Organic roots are created that promote the progressive discovery of each set of works, dialogues between them, and moments of surprise. The construction system consists of a series of metal gantries bundled together and independent from the existing walls. These 40 gantries succeed each other through the three rooms that make up the U shape of the National Gallery. Each gantry is prepared to receive a variable number of movable panels hanging from metal braces. The panels are between 1.5 and 7 meters in length and vary between 2.2 and 2.7 meters in height, depending on the ceiling height of each room. These hanging stands are painted in different colors and they allow the artworks to be exhibited in the space autonomously and with great flexibility. There is also a set of wooden furniture consisting of slender benches and tables to create reading and rest stations. Our aim was to furnish the National Palace with permanent architectural infrastructure that emphasizes the special qualities of the National Gallery itself and identifies it as a museum space. In this way, it acquires a specific and monumental character according to its context. And the last project we are bringing today is being built while we are here um, and is planned to be finished by the end of this year. It is our first house from scratch. The project for Jajalpa House is located on a plot of 1,800 square meters between Toluca and Mexico City. We want to deal with the nature by altering it as little as possible. Inside the plot, the forest is domesticated, making it more familiar, closer to the concept of garden, but maintaining it its characteristic and, gener and generating an intimate living space protected from outside noise and traffic. We propose a large central outdoor garden, which is a piece of forest condition for use in the day to day. In this way, the family is in contact with nature from the comfort of their home. The central garden is surrounded by a brick curved wall that adapts to the position of existing trees to avoid knocking down trees as much as possible. Attached to this wall rise two volumes that form a unit. The fact of dividing the program into two volumes helps to locate them within the very dense network of trees. At the same time, it offers privacy to the guests who have their own views towards the forest. The perimeter of the square house is the same as the perimeter of the curb wall, within two geometries thought as architectural programs, and once again, the outside with the inside. The first is the main body of the house. It contains the entrance, the great room, the kitchen, the guest bathroom, the study. The rooms opens to a smaller private patios, being able to take advantage of the view of the trees and the natural surroundings. The second volume, which with two levels, accommodations to the guest room. The materiality which with the house is configured is white brick that gives it a monolithic character and integrates with the surroundings, resolving the pavement and walls. 
the short essay that we wrote for the Young Architects Prize entry was entitled, Only What is Bound to Disappear Remains, or How the Ephemeral Supports the Long Lasting. When we deal with the ephemeral, the heavy weight that is usually related to architecture seems to evaporate. If something is dis destined to last just for a few weeks or months, it can be so dangerous, it needn't be so serious. Pain, experimenting, and perhaps fa failing are allowed once more. And thus, this realm become a place where the unexpected can happen. Nowadays, architecture has become ephemeral and even instant, but while the modern Western concept of ephemerality is linear as life, which ends in death, the ancient notion of ephemerality relates to something cyclical, something that dies in order to be reborn. In this way, every exhibition project that disappears enables us to move on toward the next one and never get stuck. We have noticed ideas and concepts cyclically coming back to our projects. Every time they appear, concepts can be developed in a new manner, maybe more deeply or even less deeply than the last time. If we take, for example, the installation at the Aronson Gallery, it consists of a wall, a second wall, an unnecessary wall which apparently doesn't contribute to support the building, but does actually support other five architectures. Five projects presented through a device that invites the public to submerge themselves into the atmosphere of the projects. In a time where more and more images are produced faster than ever, we propose to decelerate this rhythm in order to question whether we are producing images or spaces. Instead of inst instantaneously taking photos or digital renders, we have decided on this occasion to carefully dedicate months to build artifacts that offer an immersive experience into another place through a peephole. Lastly, all this is made possible by architecture itself, a 12 feet high, 16 feet long curvy wall that supports us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our, our last answer is through Mustafa Farouki of the Lab Lab for Architecture. And Mustafa founded the Lab Lab for Architecture in Brooklyn to reinvent potential outputs of architecture design. His work deals with relationship between support and being supported in a very interesting way through mechanical movement, phenomenological change, Architecturalization of human body and geomorphosis of elements. Recent work include a uh, celebratorium, a supportive housing scheme for the unmarried, unloved, or otherwise permanently alone, and intake facility for an anonymous uh, client in transit between heaven and earth. Mustafa is son of a prison uh, psychiatrist and a poet. He received BA in architecture and MR from Columbia University, and he holds an M MA in history of art from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Currently, he is participating in Open Sessions, a two year hybrid exhibition residency program hosted by Drawing Center. Please welcome Mustafa Faruqi. introduction and I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Architectural League for this opportunity particularly Anne, uh, Matt, Lindsay and Katerina not just for your help with the exhibition outside but also for all the conversations that we've had in the past few days it's really so thrilling to have people who ask you about your work and are sincerely listening to your answer I mean I kind of actually really live for things like that so I appreciate that also, particularly Matt, I know this is your second to last day and you've probably year in, year out been wanting to come up here and sabotage the entire program. So you have about 19 minutes to do that and make that real. Um, I'd like to also thank a lot of the, the allies, the professors and teachers, friends who, who have supported me over, over the years. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank Madeline Schwartzman, who's here, who uh, uh, was a teacher of mine at Columbia University and has now become a friend and an ally. I'd like to thank Joe Moore, who also has been uh, so supportive of my work. 
And um, I think also I would, should thank uh, a mentor and tour mentor, Jonathan Marvel and Marvel Architects, for giving me a place to land over the past two years while I've been flying around doing some of the stuff I'm going to show you today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and the Drawing Center uh, for offering space to work and also space to show my work, which in New York is really invaluable. And last but not least, I want to thank my family, my, my mom and dad, who are my inspiration, and also my brother and my sister, Karna and Shabnam who I love very much, and who have never said no to me, and this is the result of that, what you're about to see. Um, okay, the project I want to talk to you about tonight is um, one that I've been working on for a while, although it's, it's very far from finished. It's actually, I'm just going to show you kind of things that are very diffuse. It's a constellation of drawings and images and text, and I think it's a good way for me to try and sort of come up with a good narration for it, and also a good way for you to maybe see what my process is how I work, what I'm inspired by, and where I take that inspiration. Um, so I am just going to start. We have a prologue from the client. Actually, the client's name is Gabriel. And it reads like this. Come, don't sit around and masturbate. Today's your day to my great angels. Come, don't hesitate to change your fate. Don't wait till it's too late, angels. Come, you can live forever and never even ever live, angels. Come, because if you don't, it's you yourself. You'll never, ever live to forgive, angels. Come, you see, oh, sorry. Come, you see, the night's fight for the light of day. That's the fight of the angels. So come, let's make tonight the night we make right the plight of the angels. Come, let God alone in heaven yearn for the angels. Come, let heaven, lifeless and frozen, burn for the angels. Uh, disclaimer by way of uh, a historical precedent. This is Mansur al-Halaj. Uh, he's a 10th century Persian writer and thinker belonging to the devotional Sufi tradition of Islam. Mansur became the, uh, famous for his expression of love for God and his sermons demonstrated a devotion that was ecstatic but also dangerous. His most famous proclamation is evidence of his desire to be annihilated in his love for the creator. An al-Haq, an al-Haq, I am God, I am the truth. Um, unfortunately for Mansour, the ruling establishment was dubious. He was accused of blasphemy, sentenced to death, and hanged. Jumping ahead 900 years, we have someone who you probably know, India Ari. Uh, she's a, a hip-hop artist and a poet. Much like Mansour Halaj, India encourages her audience to find beauty and truth in themselves. And one of her songs, I am light, I am light, I am divinity defined, I am the God on the inside. I am a star, a piece of it all. I am light. So some might argue that Mansur al-Halaj and India Ari are both reaching for a divine power that exists inside all of us. Other might say that they're just batshit, crazy, conceited, or both. Tonight, I'd like to offer another possibility. Could it be that both India and Mansur are expressing the words of a distant but powerful voice, an anonymous, persistent voice that is desperate to be heard? Uh, the project I'm talking about today is a response to an RFP. It's an intake facility for an anonymous client. It's located on Governor's Island. Um, it's a client that's actually in a process of migration from heaven to earth. Uh, and the facility is needed to process this client and register them. So it's similar to Ellis Island up till the point when it was closed in the early 20th century, and not too different from uh, similar structures that exist at Newark Liberty Airport and Kennedy Airport. Uh, the client has very specific concerns. One, they have wings. Uh, and so here we've had to kind of come up with ways to figure out how to deal with their wings and other aspects of their physicality through diagramming. Um, they also land and take off. And so we have to have sort of very uh, particular routes for them to come in and go because of that. We can't ever forget FF and E. We're going to do bespoke, uh, bespoke chairs for all of the clients. These are two of the clients, Michael and Raphael. Um, and so there's not just physical concerns that they have, there's also existential concerns that are going to play an important part of the design. One is that they have no free will. They have no uh, gender, no sexual desire, um, and they also uh, are caught up in permanent servitude. And that's something that's been documented and it's part of our research. You can see here on the left, we have a painting by Marc Chagall. This is one of our clients helping the Israelites cross the Red Sea by parting it, which is no easy task. 
in the middle, a uh, painting by Karl Bloch, which is one of the clients um, comforting a celebrity who's pretty down. And then all the way on the right, we have one of our clients who is uh, delivering a message to the Prophet Muhammad in the middle of the Arabian desert, which probably isn't that much fun. All of it uncompensated. Um, so obviously we have to start with a conditions assessment. And what we wanted to do was think about this kind of this forced labor and how we can use that kind of, or all of the conditions that I've just talked about, and kind of bring that into an assessment that'll help us move forward with the design. So we're honing in on a particular historical incident. That is the, the night journey of the Prophet Muhammad that's been written about and rendered artistically for hundreds of years. It's the journey that uh, the Prophet Muhammad made from the Arabian Peninsula to Jerusalem to heaven. And it's been documented on the left, you see from the Safavid dynasty, uh, there's an image of it, and, and the same scene 200 years later from, uh, from northern India. It's important to us because our clients are quite visible in this, so we wanna see what their role was so we can kind of figure out what's going on and how we can use that to help our own master plan. So I'm just gonna quickly take you through some pages of, of our conditions report. Um, here, actually, from the text, it's the Sahih al-Bukhari, and it describes Muhammad's journey. By the way, the Prophet Muhammad always appears with a green attache to help you uh, in the drawings. Um, two vessels, one containing wine and the other milk, were presented to him in Jerusalem. He took the cup of milk. The angel Gabriel said, praise be to God who guided you to the right path. If you had taken the wine, your nation would have gone astray. So that's all good for Muhammad, they passed the test, but obviously you can see our clients here, it's not, beverage service isn't easy at that kind of altitude. Um, here he arrives at the, at the first level of heaven, and he's meant to be greeted by Adam and Eve, who are busy doing their thing in the upper left-hand corner. And as you can see, it's, it's our clients who are busy vacuuming and cleaning up to sort of prepare for Muhammad's arrival from the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Further on, at the second level of heaven, we see in the conditions report, um, this is where uh, the Prophet Muhammad meets the Prophet John the Baptist and also the Virgin Mary. Um, at, but we see in back of house, uh, the client Raphael is preparing uh, a holy water infused herbal tea. And meanwhile, uh, uh, the client Gabriel has actually just become a couch to sit on. And it's not all bad because the Virgin Mary here is comforting Gabriel, so there is a little bit of hope there. Um, uh, later that day, we see John the Baptist, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ browing it out in a hot tub, another situation that's supported by our clients. Uh, and lastly, the prophet Moses leads the prophet Muhammad to the last stage of heaven where there's a massive tree. It's called the Sidra tree. It's the biggest tree in the universe. And in order to get inside, guess who has to move that tree back and forth? So we basically... Um, We've kind of looked at these situations and come up with a conclusion or, or sort of at the end of the report that, that helps us, or I'm just gonna read it to you right now so you get an idea of how it ends. As you know, existing conditions reports always rhyme. Uh, the heavens are thick tonight, dense with discontent. Despair fills an air colored with lament. The heavens are thick tonight, anger beyond belief. The clouds cry aloud, a thunder crash of grief. Among the angels rancor for happiness denied, for wanton prohibitions, for dreams ossified, for fantasies deferred, deleted aspirations, love foolishly exchanged for worthless masturbations. They're done with servitude, a life degenerate. They've had all they can take of God and his bullshit. See them gathered there at heaven's door, challenging a circumstance that they've come to abhor. The edge of paradise is where we see them wait, the heavens are thick tonight, the angels are at the gate. All right, so let's talk about vertical circulation. Uh, how, how is the client going to get from heaven down to Governor's Island? Um, one thing is adaptive reuse. There's loads of gates that are available for people who are leaving Earth to go to heaven. Um, these gates uh, have been around literally forever. So we can actually sort of look at them and figure out how we can maybe try and improve them um, and gussy them up a little bit and, and make them better for the clients to use. Um, so again, sustainability is important. Uh, here is another type of gate. Again, they're one way, but we're trying to make the gates two ways so that you can enter and exit. Um, 
We're also really borrowing from the, the language of ferries and ferry terminals and landings and slips because that's so much part of the imaginary of Governor's Island. And so we've created a, a sky ferry for our client to, um, to leave heaven and come down closer to the earth. And here's a landing for that ferry where I can dock and then the client can safely exit. Uh, here's an elevation of that. Um, and some of the signs also appear in Spanish. So uh, here also another important bit of the project is a constellation of hubs around Governor's Island because the, the clients, they have to be processed and vetted. In fact, they have to be extremely vetted. So there's a chance that they could be waiting at these, at these hubs for days, months, or even years. And so they have to be quite comfortable. We've um, designed one for uh, the tippy top of the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and that's where the holding area would be. Um, and that's where this, you can see that's where it sort of snugly fits in there between the tower. And here's the disembarkation point. And then you enter into this really nice comfort station which has uh, fountains and trees and things like that and it's a place of relaxation. What it also has, this one's actually held up by jets and this one's held up by balloons. And what it also has is, uh, it has these little cabins where the clients can go and reflect, write letters, write postcards, make phone calls, and it turns out that the clients are actually using these little phone stations to make one last call to God. Um, and these phone calls or letters to God, they're actually kept in a secure server, and at some point they will finally be delivered to God when it's safe in heaven. At least that's what we thought would happen, but it turns out um, so it turns out that, that uh, these messages have actually been leaked, and I have a copy of, of some of these messages that I'm actually going to, if you don't mind, read to you. Uh, and you'll notice that these people, that, or sorry, the, the client, the users, they talk with a particular lisp and they have a particular accent, so you can kind of figure out what they're saying and even join in if you so desire. So here's one message. Everything I gave to you, and I said, Allah, Allah, you made me a slave to you, and I said, Allah, Allah. Day and night I flew the skies, and I said, Allah, Allah. I waited on your terse replies, and I said, Allah, Allah. I dreamed of things I fantasized, and I said, Allah, Allah. Incessantly I said goodbyes, and I said, Allah, Allah. I thought without you I can't cope, and I said, Allah, Allah. I turned my face away from hope, and I said, Allah, Allah. When times were good, I bowed my head and I said, Allah, Allah. When times were bad, I cried in bed and I said, Allah, Allah. You had bad days, I bore the brunt and I said, Allah, Allah. You made me feel a worthless cunt and I said, Allah, Allah. For me, denied was every plea and I said, Allah, Allah. For Moses, though, you split the sea and I said, Allah, Allah. You told me you're the only one and I said, Allah, Allah. Then came Mary's bastard son and I said, Allah, Allah. You said, Muhammad's my new fave, and I said, Allah, Allah. Go find him in some desert cave, and I said, Allah, Allah. They asked me, who has wronged you? And I said, Allah, Allah. I'm leaving him, and they said, who? And I said, Allah, Allah. Access. Um, so I'm going to take you now to the part on Governor's Island where they're actually sort of going to arrive. Uh, here's the bit of the island that we're working on, the northern bit. Here's our master plan. And I'm going to start right here with, uh, this is the, um, the, bat the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel Ventilation Tower. And this makes a good spot for the control tower that's going to help these clients land at Governor's Island without all crashing into each other. There'll be trained government officials working there. Uh, there's two landing points for the client. One is above Castle William. It's brightly lit so it can be seen at night. There's uh, a, a gate for each arrival. And there's another uh, landing point above the Island Post Hospital. You can see that here. Um, and this one's actually pretty special because here we've designed a, a sky deck where you, where visitors can actually go and see it. So you go to Governor's Island, you ride that like massive stupid tricycle that everybody has to ride when they're there, and you have the cotton candy, and then when you're done with all of that, you can pay a little bit of money and go up these escalators, and then you can sit in that spot right there, and you can watch all of these, and watch the clients sort of coming down, and that must be an amazing sight. Obviously, you'd have to wear glasses, otherwise you'd go blind. 
Um, okay, so moving on to the issue of transvalence, which is something that I've trademarked. That's, that's sort of a, a tra traveling in between states. And it could be a mortality versus living forever, or it could be ground versus earth. Um, and so that's something that I had to really think about in terms of how we represent the inside. Uh, because we can render out the outside any way we want, but showing the inside is actually more complicated, especially the point where the humans uh, and the clients meet each other for the first time. What does that actually look like? And I was thinking a little bit about um, the idea of the abject, of something that is recognizable to you yet completely unfamiliar, something that's been in your memory for your whole life and yet you don't, when you see it, you have no idea what it is. This is a painting by, by Sima. It's showing one of our clients, Raphael, meeting Tobias. And so it's that moment of, of irrecognition and recognition at the same time. Um, kind of like seeing something you're familiar with here, and again, something vaguely familiar but unknown. And so I'm using drawing as a way of showing that. Um, this is a, a client scanner channel, and I'm taking an oblique, an isometric, and then a diametric projection and trying to composite them so that when we put them all together, we start to barely recognize something, but at the same time, it's unfamiliar or vague. So these are experiments I did with that. Then again, other things that'll be sort of littered around the facility, a window panel, a banquette, an identification booklet, and sort of kind of compositing these different projections to see uh, if there's some third thing that might emerge. How does this work with the design of the actual facility? Well, if we took a slice through concourse A, I think maybe it'll look something like this. There's like, a, we have oblique projection and also diametric, and there's some third thing that starts to emerge from that. Maybe we wanna zoom in to one of, the, one of the gates, and so maybe that's this. These are two different projections, and yet a third thing kind of starts to appear. And if we zoom in even more to the door, and here we can see how we have, you know, there's one projection, the oblique going like this, which is showing the client's entry, and then there's another projection, the diametric, showing the circulation of the guards and the army that are gonna be sort of the human content of the facility. Uh, here's some more experiments I did with mechanical, and the one on the right is actually an ortho orthogonal view combined with an oblique. More mechanical, this time with perspective and an axonometric combined. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna quickly take you through these in the interest of time. Uh, this is a, a tower above the, the old library where the clients will be further processed. You can see the transvalence though kind of happening inside. Uh, here's a more detailed view. And then on the right, you can kind of see these people who are in the observation tower, what they're actually looking out at or an idea of what that might look like. There's also a little fun center with dancers for the employees. Um, and this is uh, where it would be from the outside. Okay, egress. Uh, so once the client has gone through processing, they will then land on the earth for the first time. However, before that happens, they have one, absolutely one, and only one last chance to turn back and go to heaven. And here's some signage showing that, that that point is approaching. And here we have a decision point. It's like a marketing meeting. There's a no, a, a, a go or a no go. And you can either go down towards uh, where the ground is or you have one last chance to, to go back up through that, that travel or that travelator which goes back up to the exit area. Again, if you decide to go down, you would go through this ramp, touch the ground. And if you want to go back to heaven, you have to go through this set of uh, this exit barrier where there'll be personnel from heaven waiting there. They're probably going to be pretty pissed off. They'll re-register you, and then you can make your way. Oh, this is a detail of the exit barrier. Then you can make your way back up to heaven. And so, let's see. And then that's the outside of that, the chute that goes back up into the sky. This is the point here where you would finally touch the ground for the first time if you decided to stay. Okay, epilogue. 
Um, so you've been noticing that actually we've been, we have our own media that we use to design, but there's an outside media, there's newspapers and magazines that are kind of showing a different scenario with what's happening with this facility and kind of the public debate about it. And uh, so that's gonna come up in a second. One thing I wanted to talk about also in the epilogue is, although we're ending now, this is actually where the project kind of begins because to, to actually enjoy life on Earth, the clients are gonna experience two things that they've never had before and those are money and sex. So we'll start with the more important one. We have created right here uh, a, a facility that actually attaches genitalia to the client and what they do is they slide in through this slot horizontally and then the genitalia actually just gets attached to them through like a baking process and because of all the heat, because of all the heat that that releases, we've had to fill the top with cold water um, and then when, when the client finally emerges, they can actually, there's these, these little cubicles we've made where they can test out or take their new bits for a test drive. Um, and here's one of them. You can see actually that things aren't perfect. There's nothing perfect. They haven't left a perfect world and they haven't arrived in a perfect world either. So that's an important thing to remember. Here's another one of, this, of the suites. And then here's another one. Um, and here's a different type of cubicle. This is one where the client can open the door, go in completely by themselves, shut the door, sit down, and learn how to use a cash register. Because, because not only are they gonna be able to have sex, they're gonna have to make money and they'll probably have to join the service sector. And so another part that comes much later is this service sector orientation center. And this brings us full circle because we started talking about the labor and the tasks these clients have to do up in, up in heaven and they're not making any money and they have to live forever. Here they'll be doing almost the same tasks. They'll be making minimum wage and they get to die. <laughs> when, you combine, when you combine money and sex, obviously there's gonna be advertising and there's loads of advertising that we have available. If you're interested in a slot, you can see me afterwards. And so now I'm just gonna close. So I've said that it's not gonna be a perfect world and yet the, the protagonist who we started with, which is client Gabriel, is still adamant and still wants to go at any cost. And so um, he's issued a statement to his comrades and it's become part of an addendum. So those of you keeping track, this is addendum number one. You say you fly high, you have all you desire. You think you're high now, I'll take you higher, come with me. Your world is so dry, I'll make it perspire. I got the juice that you require, come with me. Let go of heaven, make God a pariah. He may not be dead, but he needs to retire, come with me. I know you're scared, I know you're tired. What you need is hope, I'll be your supplier, come with me. You can be Luke, I'll be Princess Leia. We'll both strike back with our empire. Come with me. I'm here to help. I'm here to help you. I can't get, oh, sorry, I'm missing a line here. Let's see, I'll go to the next one. Time's running out. Your situation is dire. Make up your mind, it's down to the wire. Come with me. They'll tell you I'm crazy. They'll tell you I'm crazy. They'll call me a liar. Why would I lie? Don't be a denier. Come with me. It's not a joke, it's not satire. It's no sweet, sweet fantasy, baby. My name's not Mariah, come with me. And remember, remember, before you piss on my hot fire, I am the truth, I am light, I am the Messiah. Come with me, thank you. I don't know what happened to that story. Thank you, Mustafa, I'll come with you. So uh, today's lecture is ended, and I hope you all enjoyed today. And there will be, there will be a, a recession at the ho in the hallway, so please join the recession. Thank you.
you think it's because the battery is really low? Yeah. That is good 